This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and to today's episode where we're going to be carrying on the World War II theme that we've touched on in a number of episodes recently. Today we're talking about one of the latest Australian campaigns of the entire war, which is Bougainville. And the name Bougainville probably means a lot to people because it's so famous in military history, but I, but it's one of those campaigns that just isn't very well understood at all. Um, and it's also very controversial. There's always been questions about Bougainville from its earliest days as to whether that battle should even have been fought, whether Australia should have been so aggressive in that campaign, whether the the men who were killed um, gave their lives in vain. It's it's a controversial subject is a controversial campaign and I'm looking forward to digging into this and finding a bit more out about it. So we're being joined today by Carl James from the Australian War Memorial. You've heard Carl a few times on the podcast and he just knows this stuff better than just about anyone in the country. So I'm really looking forward to it. So let's dive in and hear from Carl James about the Battle of Bougainville. Carl, thanks for joining us again on Living History. You've been on the show. I think this is now the third time we've had you on the show and your discussions about the Pacific War and Remembrance have been some of our most popular episodes. So always great to have you uh, on the show, mate. Oh, no worries, Matt. It's great to be back and I really enjoy conversations and I think the podcast is going great. I'm a regular listener. So it's always fun to be um, on this part of the conversation. Well, that's good to hear. You don't get much more of an endorsement than that coming from Carl James. But um, I listen to you about it at night. It's a bit weird at times. but Wow, uh, that, uh, yeah, that puts a whole new perspective on it. So <laughs> that's very interesting. I wanted to get you on, mate, to talk about Bougainville because it's something that you and I have discussed over beers and in sort of casual settings over the years because you, um, you've done a lot of work on the Bougainville campaign. And I'm absolutely fascinated with the Bougainville campaign because it was one of Australia's latest actions of the war that took place during World War II. Um, and it's controversial even to today. So I, I'm really looking forward to just digging into that history and, and learning a little bit more about uh, the Bougainville campaign. So why don't we kick it off with, well, let's start with where exactly is Bougainville? We know it's in the Pacific, but where exactly is it located? Yeah, it's a great question. So Bougainville is one of the, the northern, more most northern islands in the Solomon Island chain. So it's sits in the in the Pacific Ocean. And if you imagine, um, you have a map of Australia in your mind, you've got Australia to the north of us, you have Papua and New Guinea, and just move east. So you move past New Britain, and then you hit this long chain of islands. Um, Bougainville is in the northwestern corner. And then if you just say run sort of southeast, you'd run down that island chain to Guadalcanal. So that's the line of islands that is known as the slot. And I should remind people here that only a few weeks ago, I did a podcast about Guadalcanal. Um, and this dovetails very neatly with, um, with, with what was happening at Guadalcanal because Bougainville followed on very soon after. But that chain of islands is known as the slot, isn't it, in the Solomon Islands? Yeah, that's right. And in many ways, it goes back to the darkest moments of the, the Pacific War, 1942. So the Japanese invaded Rabaul in New Britain in January of 1942. Uh, the Japanese then basically move, they have two axes, like a, like a Y. So from Rabaul, they move south and move into New Guinea. Uh, and then they also move across the other axis down through the Solomon Islands. So they take Bougainville, um, parts of it in 1942, but then they roll on and eventually get to Guadalcanal. So if you're thinking about um, the Pacific Ocean, Rabaul is quite key um, and it controls the operations in New Guinea as well as the Solomon Islands. And so from the Allies' point of view, from 42, but especially 43, as the war changes uh, and the Allies are now on the offensive, we want to take um, head back towards Rabaul, isolate Rabaul. And this is following on from that very bloody, vicious campaign um, fought by American forces on Guadalcanal into 42, early 43, and also complements uh, the Australian campaign as well as fought in Papua at the same time and then leading up into New Guinea in, the, in 1943 as well. The focus on Rabaul is a really important part of the story, isn't it? Because it was Operation Cartwheel, the idea that they would circle around the, uh, the, the island and cut it off rather than attacking it head on. And Bougainville would uh, eventually play a fairly major role in that, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely, because following the Japanese decision to withdraw from Guadalcanal, the survivors, the Japanese survivors, are evacuated. They're evacuated back up that Solomon Island, back up the slot, uh, and they reinforce and they dig in on Bougainville itself. So Bougainville went from being a bit of a backwater in early 1942. Yes, the Japanese had developed garrisons there. Um, they had built and maintained a military infrastructure along the island itself. 
Um, but it's not really until 1943 because the Japanese are on the back foot. They lose Guadalcanal. They still want to hang on to the Solomon Islands. And so they withdraw their forces back to Bougainville itself. And if you think about Bougainville, it's, you kind of think of it like um, – Imagine it's long and it's narrow. Imagine a jelly bean. It kind of gives you that sort of orientation for the island. And you divide the island in two. So you've got two massive mountain ranges that cut the island in half. You have the uh, sort of the Emperor Range, the northern part of island of the island itself, and then the Crown Prince Range, which is in the southern half of the island. Now, um, before the war, most people, so you Bougainvillians, the Solomon Islanders, and a number of European um plantation workers and the like. They either lived in the north of Bougainville, around Bucher Island, or in the south, around Boone. Uh, and there are also some major civilian settlements on the eastern part of the island, around Numa Numa and Quito. It's a big island. I've been there, and it's, uh, it's, it's a big island dominated by a huge volcano in the middle. And I've got to say, from my personal experience, some of the toughest jungle I've seen. I mean, I've trekked all over Guadalcanal. I've been to New Guinea um, but in terms of just thick, impenetrable, in hostile, not in hostile, hostile jungle, um, it, uh, it's, it, 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 there's really no second place for, to, to Bougainville. It's, it's quite a severe place to fight. It was pretty hard. And some of the, as the war went on, there were a number of veterans who'd fought in other parts of New Guinea, as well as the Kokoda Trail. And when these units were posted to Bougainville and fought there in, say, 44, 45, um, many of the men thought that the conditions along the Numa Numa Trail, for example, so that was one of the key axes of the Australian advance, they thought that those conditions, that the physicality of the terrain was even tougher than, say, what they had experienced along the Kokoda Trail. So it is a, a very remote area. There was very little infrastructure that had been developed either before the war or during the conflict. Um, it was remote, very dense jungle, um, uh, you know, and that means rain. It, so you have mountain peaks, um, cold at night, hot during the day. It's wet, it's steamy, um, not a lot of infrastructure, not a lot of roads. Um, the campaign, a lot of this work was done during the course of the campaign. So it's a remote area, um, which also fed into the nature of it being somewhat isolated and marginalised as well. We should also remember, I mean, we'll get into this in more detail, but we should remember here the Japanese as well when we tell all these stories that there's, you know, the, the, we, we, we often talk about the suffering of the, the, the poor Aussie blokes on the Kokoda Track or in Bougainville or the, the American Marines in Guadalcanal. But through all of this, we should remember the underlying thread that the poor old Japanese, I mean, you know, and this is, this is not a political statement, I'm talking about the welfare of the men here, the, the, the blokes that had to fight there from the Japanese perspective. I mean, they called Guadalcanal Starvation Island. It was so difficult to supply them. And by the time they left in very early 1943, they were a ragged bunch of starving men. And to then be sent to Bougainville and then have to live in the jungle where there were no facilities and to set up defensive positions knowing they would also be attacked in the coming months on Bougainville must have just been horrendous for the Japanese soldiers that were sent there. Oh, absolutely. Um, incredibly isolated, very little thought had been given to logistics. So before the war, it's thought that the Bougainville, um, Bougainville had a population of about 52,000 people. They were like mainly uh, Bougainville Islanders. And as I mentioned, they're largely around the, the northern part in Bucca Island, down south around Boone, and then on the east coast, uh, with a larger sort of population centres, or more like population clusters in many ways. And so when the Japanese... Um, withdrawal to Bougainville from Guadalcanal and also they are reinforced from Rabaul as well. At its peak, there are thought to be about 65,000 Japanese soldiers on the island. Uh, so you now have Japanese soldiers outnumbering uh, the number of Bougainville Islanders. So what does that mean? It means you have a large number of, basically the island population doubles. So there's a lot of pressure put on for food, um, crops, uh, a lot of native gardens or the gardens tended by the Solomon Islanders were taken over by the Japanese. The Japanese themselves, while they can deliver soldiers and you know, um, ammunition and ordnance, not great on food, medicine, uh, medical supplies. So they can move soldiers and they can arm them. Uh, lots of guns, lots of ammunition, not a lot of food, very poor medical care, very poor medical attention. And so during that 43 into the 44 period, for example, um, the Japanese soldiers become into quite a bad state. There's this big spike in starvation, disease, um, malnutrition. It's thought that some 30,000 Japanese died from sickness and disease. It's just incredible, isn't it? Imagine that went on in the... I mean, imagine if our account 
from an allied perspective of a battle or the, or a certain phase of the war was that we lost 30,000 men dying from starvation or disease. It would just be an absolute scandal. But for the poor old Japanese soldier, that was just his daily life. It was pretty horrific. Um, and it's something which we just cannot comprehend. And I think that's quite important when we are talking about these operations in the Pacific. Yes, we need to talk about the Australians and the American experience. I think you need to talk about the Japanese. But you also need to talk, too, about the Solomon Islanders and, say, the Papuans and New Guineans. Because in these areas around Boone and Buka, uh, Torikina, Numanuma, and all the other different areas, once the Japanese soldiers moved in, they then dispossessed. Well, partly they dispossessed the Bougainville Islanders um, by force, but also, too, we know the Bougainville Islanders, they just moved inland. So they moved away from their villages. They moved away from their crops. They had to set up new homes. Um, we talk about refugees I mean, in the sense of, say, the European war, like we can imagine the Dutch or the French living under German occupation. But there are some similarities, too, in the Pacific. So when the Japanese moved into these areas, you had the, the local people, the men were usually forced to work for the Japanese, sort of labouring, tending, um, working as carriers and the like. Whereas the women and children went bush, they had to survive and fend for themselves. That meant they would need to set up new gardens. But that takes time. Like you need to clear a ground, plant a crop, wait for it to come up. So from that pre-war population of 52,000, it's thought that about a quarter of the Bougainville Islanders died during the Japanese occupation and as a result of the war. So the Bougainville Islanders, they're being starved, their food supplies are being cut off. They're not receiving medical attention for about three years. Um, from 42 until about 45, and their death rates continue into 46. It's not until about 1947 that the, the health of the Bougainville Islanders starts, starts to encourage. So this is a really big war and it's a big campaign, and that's even before the Americans land and before the Australians take over. Well, that's a good point. This is just in the pre-battle uh, history that we're talking about here. I was reading somewhere the other day just on that subject of what it was like to be a person under Japanese rule in the Second World War. By 1945, at the time of the bombings, the atomic bombings that ended the war, 200,000 civilians a month were dying under Japanese occupation. It's just absolutely staggering. We, we Obviously, we talk about the humanitarian crisis that was going on in Europe under the Nazis, but the, the amount of people that the Japanese either killed deliberately or through neglect or through taking food and resources that those people needed to survive was absolutely staggering. Oh, it, it totally is, Matt. And I think even, what, 75 years at the end of the conflict, the conflict is so vast and so costly in terms of sort of blood and treasure. We still don't really understand um, the extent of what occurred. And it's really hard to, for us to make these connections today. So if we think globally during the second world war at least 60 million people died that is one person every three seconds just astonishing that's just astonishing back to bougainville specifically so you've, you've painted a good picture where this island is at the, the top of the solomon's chain it was in the solomon islands during the second world war now it's part of papua new guinea um carl would you say that bougainville was important in either a strategic or a tactical sense or was it merely just another one of the stepping stones uh, on the way to rabal Certainly from the Japanese perspective, because they, what they want to do is to defend Rabaul. Rabaul is the major base in the Southwest Pacific, the Japanese major base. And so they fortified Bougainville because they want it becomes part of their quite strong outer defensive island chain. Um, the thing to keep in mind is by 43, the Japanese have lost their advantage that they had from uh, naval and air assets. So they're still large. They have a lot of soldiers on the ground. They can't really move them. So to compensate for that, the area and territory that they have, they want to fortify and wear down any potential and make it so tough and so prickly that the Allies won't attack them because the Japanese think that the Americans as well as the Australians won't want to suffer heavy casualties. So it's key from the Japanese perspective. Now, from the ally point of view, uh, if we're now thinking about mid-1943 into early 1944, Bougainville is significant um, but what they want to do and what the Americans want to do is just to capture a part of Bougainville itself, um, a bit of territory which they can then fortify and defend because they want to develop airstrips because the Americans have the advantage in, by mid-43 of having um, you know, a large fleet that defeated largely in the main part, the Japanese Navy, so the US United States Navy as well as the contribution from the Royal Australian Navy and our allies. So we have the advantage at sea and we certainly have the advantage at, in the air. We don't need 
um, to take the entire island, or we as in, say, the Americans or the Australians, we don't need to take all of Bougainville, just need to develop an area, build in um, airfields, bring in those air support, air assets to then make further a strike against Rabaul. I think that's a really great point. We we tend to underestimate the importance of air power during the Second World War um, because it really was absolutely dominant. I mean, it still is today, but this was really the start of it in the Second World War, wasn't it? That when if you had aircraft on an airfield, you just controlled a huge swathe of area around you. Troops could not move in daylight hours for fear of being attacked. Ships could definitely not come in for fear of being sunk. And other aircraft couldn't fly in to resupply troops. So having an airfield located in a a tactically important position close to your enemy really denied that enemy the opportunity to to resupply, to attack, to even move its troops, didn't it? It did. And so you need to think about too, think about Rabaul as being like a a bicycle wheel. And so Rabaul is at the centre and you have all the spokes. And in 42, from Rabaul, the Japanese were taking those spokes and attacking into Bougainville, Solomons, Papua New Guinea. And now it's reversed um, because the Allies are on the offensive. So we can attack and target Rabaul from Port Moresby, from Leigh, um, from areas in New Britain, from Guadalcanal, from Bougainville and, and Torikina, where the Americans would land. So you were then trying to cut off the Japanese rebel and then increasingly strangle them. And by having a number of different airfields, that means you can attack the Japanese um, with heavy bombers, medium bombers, fighter aircraft. You have can fight, have, your fighter aircraft can protect and escort your heavy bombers. Um, and so you're starting to use this material advantage to cut off and strangle the Japanese at Rabaul. And by developing an air base at Torikina, um, which is on the west coast of Bougainville, the Americans are then can further tighten their grip on the Japanese at Rabaul. Well, let's talk about the US landings, because I think from an Australian perspective, we tend to focus Mostly, it's understandable, on the Australian operations of 44 and 45. Uh, But the Americans arrived there in 43, didn't they? Uh, They certainly do. So while I mentioned earlier that the Japanese tended to live around the north and southern part of of Bougainville, so they took over the civilian or the areas that had had a larger civilian population, and they also had a big um, bases on the eastern part of the island, the Americans thought, well, we don't need to take and clear the entire island. We don't don't need to fight all the Japanese. And so the Americans land on the West Coast, uh, a lower, but there's less of a population, less of a Japan concentration of Japanese forces, because it's the whole idea of landing where the enemy isn't. What the Americans want to do is move in, d- develop a base quite rapidly, build airstrips, and then they fortify this outer perimeter uh, around about a place called Torikina, which is on the western side of um, Bougainville Island. It wasn't, Torikina itself wasn't near anywhere, and it's almost right in the middle of the island. So you couldn't get any further from the large Japanese concentrations in the north of Buka, which tends to be Japanese Navy, and then the big concentration of Japanese armies in the south around Boone. So the Americans land at Torikina, right in the middle of the island, away from the Japanese, because the Americans aren't interested in fighting and clearing the entire island. They just want to establish their airfields at Torikina, and they do that very successfully. The US landings at... Um... Bougainville and the fighting at Bougainville is something that I think more Australians should look into because it is it is actually quite a tale. It was you know it was a it was a tough landing against the Japanese at Torikina. Uh, it was the Marines that came in and then handed over to army units, and um, it's it's quite a quite a remarkable story. Several medals of honour were awarded for actions at at Bougainville, and I when I went to Bougainville, I was very lucky to go there in the in the company of a US veteran who had landed there on the first day as a Marine as an eighteen year old. And I went there with to, uh, to Torikina with him, and it was a really long way to get there. We had to go by boat. It was very difficult to get there. And he had landed on the first morning of the US invasion in November 43. He had landed on this little island called Purata Island, which was out in the middle of the bay. So his, uh, his platoon was really there to capture a couple of Japanese machine guns that might have put some uh, flanking fire into the landing force. So they landed on Purata and... I walked the island with Chuck and, and he recounted just what it was like. And so it was pretty amazing when he stepped ashore on that beach for the first time since, uh, since 1943 and talked about clearing the Japanese of, uh, of uh, clearing the Japanese from that island during that night and the following day. And um, it's just a, it was always a real privilege. I mean, Chuck's still alive. It, he's, he's, he's still going strong. It was, just, it was just such a privilege to go to a place like this and, and, and walk the ground with a veteran. I mean, have you met in your time many veterans from the, uh, from the Bougainville campaign, Cut? 
I met a number of Australian veterans because um, I've been living with Bogan for a long time. It, originally, it was my PhD thesis, which I started all the way back in 2001. Um, and back in the early thousands, um, there were many more Second World War veterans, and I had quite the privilege to meet um, quite a few. Um, unfortunately, now, though, the Bougainville veterans that I know and met have all passed away. Um, so with your experience of going to Bougainville, hitting the beach with the US Marine, um, that would be incredibly special. It was a really great experience. He's a great man and had lots of good stories. He was a Marine Raider as well, so he was like the Marine oh, nice. Special Forces. So um, they um, they took part. Also, and there's a later amphibious, I can't remember the details, but they landed in rubber boats further up the beach and expanded the perimeter. It was you know all tales of you know heroics and, and near death just about every day. But um, so thank you for that. So the US land, they establish a base. And as you explained, they, they dug this quite a sizable perimeter to keep the Japanese out. How did the Japanese respond to the US invasion on the island? Well, it took a, a little while for the Japanese to respond. So the US Marines, they were the spearhead of the Allied invasion. Um, they land in November 43 around Torikina, then spend the next few weeks and months expanding that bridgehead and making it secure. It's not until March of 1944 that the Japanese are in a position to make a counterattack uh, and the Japanese attack in force, but because they're now attacking against entrenched U.S. Marines. So what, what does that mean? So that means the U.S. Marines have dug, dug trenches, they've done pill, dug pillboxes, they have overhead uh, cover from uh, timber cover, machine guns are set up, mines, barbed wire, artillery, aircraft. This is a major military operation. And so the Japanese are attacking. Imagine like the images of, say, in the Western Front during the First World War, infantry attacking that type of fortified entrenched positions. Same sort of thing in the Pacific, except it's hotter and it's wetter and more humid. Uh, and the Japanese suffer very heavy casualties during that March 1944 Japanese counterattack, um, so much so that they then pull back and for the rest of the year, um, into late 1944, there's this kind of a, a live and let live approach. The Japanese don't try to make a major push against the Americans at Torikina. Likewise, the Americans don't really go out patrolling beyond its perimeter very much. Um, they'll patrol a little bit, but they're not in a position, nor do they want to, explore or push or clear or liberate the, the entire island. The, the Americans are only really interested in defending Torikina. I um, think this is really one of the most fascinating or <laughs> certainly interesting parts of the story is just, I mean, it's America. They've just got such a huge force. They Obviously, the airfields are essential that they're building there and pretending that, uh, protecting the perimeter. But also, they've got a pretty big garrison there. And they, you know, the things I've read about them trying to make life comfortable for their troops, they made baseball fields and put in... The one thing I loved was they even set up an ice cream maker in the island so that you could, so that at Torikina, people could come and get ice cream. Um, it really must have been, compared to some of the hardships going on elsewhere in the Pacific, it, it wouldn't have been a bad gig to be assigned to that uh, force at Torikina, particularly in early 1944, I would imagine. Oh, in some ways, boredom was the biggest threat. So the U.S. Marines take the landing, fight the big battles. They're then replaced by the U.S. Army troops, um, the equivalent of about two divisions. And this, uh, as you mentioned, the force is huge. It's about 65,000 Americans are based around Torikina. Uh, and the So it's a major city. It becomes a major city, heavily fortified on the outside. But inside there are baseball fields. There's movie cinemas. There's two uh, Coca-Cola factories, an ice cream plant. Um there's a lot of sort of base infrastructures. So not, I won't say cushy because it's still remote, but this isn't sort of, you know, this arrival, Kokoda in 1942. The other thing that I thought was interesting is the, the live and let live attitude, I think, uh, existed with the Japanese as well, who were obviously exhausted after a lot of them had been on Guadalcanal. They tried to push the Americans off Bougainville unsuccessfully and they were, as we said before, they were starving, they were suffering from disease. So I think the Japanese on the island gave an impression of, uh, of being all too keen to just live and let live as well because I, there was an account I read for an American who said they used to go down to a baseball field they had set up at the base and play baseball and a, a wretched, ragged Japanese used to come out and stand on the sidelines and watch them play baseball. Yeah, I've heard that story too. It's one of those things that's probably apocryphal, um, but it does well illustrate that sense of live and let live. And in what, and really many ways, the American forces. So, General Griswold is the American commander at Torikina 
in the latter part of 44, um, he and his men have lost interest. They're thinking about, you know, they want to get to the Philippines because uh, that's where they know the next big campaign is going to be. And there is a general sort of um, the American soldiers, the American GIs, for example, they're not patrolling. There's little patrolling. They're not trying to go out to no man's land. They're not trying to dominate the uh, the enemy. They're not seeking out the Japanese. Um, there is a big fall in intelligence estimates. So the numbers of Japanese, because the Americans aren't that interested, they estimate there's maybe 12, possibly 16,000 Japanese soldiers on the island. Um, and they all follow this idea of the Japanese um, uh, this is when you start to develop this approach of letting the Japanese wither on the vine. So when they do see the soldiers, the, the Japanese soldiers, they're in pretty poor condition. Um, they know they're cut off. Yes, there's still maybe 12, 16,000 Japanese soldiers on the island, but they're not going anywhere. You know, there's no ships, there's no aircraft, they don't have any vehicles, so they're not a major offensive threat. And if we just leave them, they will die in the jungle. So they have that sense of there is no need or not the necessity now to actively go out and to fight a campaign because the Americans, the GIs are at Torokina, they want to get to the next show, to the next action, which is the Philippines. So by the latter part of 44, um, the need for any offensive operations on Bougainville, it's thought, has dropped off and it becomes a bit of a secondary theatre um, to other act, more exciting actions being fought elsewhere in the Pacific. We're always pretty quick to jump in and it's some sort of cultural superiority where we think our blokes knew how to fight really well and the Americans weren't so good at it. But I think it's important to say that um, the American attitude on Bougainville made excellent military sense, that they had done what they set out to do, which was build airfields to, to, to basically cut off Bougainville from the rest of the, the Japanese in the Pacific. They could then use Bougainville as a forward base in their attacks on Rabaul. They had a very secure perimeter the Japanese were never going to take. And so the concept of not going out and wasting men by killing or attempting to kill Japanese who were completely isolated and potentially going to starve to death in the jungle anyway made very good uh, made very good um, military sense, didn't it? It did from the perspective, say, of um, 1944, so mid-1944. But now we come really to the next part of the story. So while we've just set up why, about, why Bougainville was important to the Japanese, how the Americans responded... Towards the end of 44, this is the time when um, in Bougainville, as well as areas around Wewak, or in New Guinea and in New Britain itself, we have a handover from these garrisons going from American forces over to the Australian forces. So the war is, you know, ramping up, looking towards the Philippines. MacArthur wants these Americans, as I said before, there's two divisions, the equivalent of two divisions to Torokina, 65,000 men. He wants those men to be deployed or to be available for operations in the Philippines. Hence, we'll say, all right, Australia, now's your time to shine. You can take over this garrison. Um, and in doing that, this is when MacArthur sets out to General Blamey and the Australian commanders. MacArthur says, look, we think there's about twelve to 16,000 Japanese soldiers on the island. Um, you can take over Torikina, but I want you to employ the equivalent of five infantry brigades. So Blamey thinks... Blame the Australian commander thinks, well, five, that's a lot. That's almost a division and a half. That's a lot of guys. Do we need this many? We could surely we can do less, but MacArthur is insistent. Um, part of the reason for this is he, partly ego. So while the Australians will take over from the Americans, it will be half the size of the American strength. Um, and that then commits the Australian forces. Well, we've got, you know, almost a division and a half. What are we going to do with these guys? And so when they take over at Torikina, they think, well, the Japanese are in a pretty poor state. Um, the Australian soldiers were fresh. They were well supplied, well equipped. Um, they were told the Japanese were sort of starving, withering on the vine. The numbers are quite small. And also, too, the Australians couldn't leave Bougainville or Torikina until either. So this is now late 44. People were predicting the war would continue until 1946. So you've got a bit of a manpower crisis within Australia. And the question is, do we leave a sizable military force in Torikina and as well as New Guinea and elsewhere for an indefinite length of time? Or should the Australians fight a limited offensive campaign against an enemy whose numbers they think are quite small are in a, and in a very um, weak position? So who were these Australians that uh, they sent to Bougainville? Were these veterans of, of North Africa? Were they veterans of the Kokoda campaign? Were they experienced fighters or were they relatively new troops? 
it's a real mixture. So um, uh, the Second Australia Corps takes over in Bougainville in late 1944. The Second Australia Corps is commanded by Lieutenant General Stanley Savage. Um, Savage is a very interesting commander. He worked his way up um, from a soldier in the First World War, commissioned the Gallipoli, serves Western Front, um, the Dunster Force in 1918. Um, he's a citizen soldier, a bit prickly, interesting personality, great friend and supporter of Blamey. So Savage takes over the 2nd Australia Corps, which is based around the 3rd Division. Uh, and later on, he'd also receive the 11th Brigade and the, as well as the 23rd Brigade. So in total, during 1945, um, there was about 33,000 Australian soldiers on the island. This, again, a sizable force. In the main, they were veterans. Um, some units have served extensively in New Guinea, so from 43 to 44. Um, the 7th Brigade, for example, had fought at Milne Bay in 1942, had a period of garrison work in New Guinea in 43, 44, before moving over to Bougainville. Um, whereas some other units themselves are quite fresh. And so some of the battalions from the 23rd Brigade, for example, so the 7th and 8th Battalions and the 31st, 51st uh, Battalion, this will be their first campaign. So you have a mixture of units and officers and men, some of whom have been fighting for three or four years with a lot of combat experience in the Pacific. Others were quite young soldiers who even though they've been in the army for three or four years, this was their first their first action. Because part of this too is that with the second, um, the units that made up the second Australian Corps were essentially uh, militia or had been militia in origin. So by this late period in 44, 45, especially in 45, you do have a number of AIF men who volunteer and they go into these units as reinforcements. There's still a little bit of that stigma between your volunteer soldier of the AIF and your, your choco or your militiamen of the, the militia units. Carl, what was the feeling at an official level from Australia about what appears to be a policy of America wanting to take the lead on the new big popular invasions, you know, the ones that are going to get the news headlines, and leaving its allies, who had already carried quite a bit of the uh, the work up to this point in the Pacific War, to just simply garrison various islands once they were considered safe. Was there an official Australian position on this, or did we just shrug and get on with it? It's kind of fought and contested throughout 40, late 44 and into 45, because even from the start of the relationship between um, Douglas MacArthur and Prime Minister John Curtin, MacArthur had always told Curtin that he would take our forces with us, with him, back to the Philippines. So MacArthur saw New Guinea as an obstacle in order to get back to the Philippines, where he wanted to be, his main show, his um, real... What he wanted to get to was the Philippines. That was his major goal. Well, that was where he left from, wasn't it? The famous I shall return. And, I mean, it was a, it was a U.S. territory, wasn't it, the Philippines? It was probably the only U.S. territory in the Pacific. Um, so it was pretty important to the Americans from a symbolic point of view that they take that back from the Japanese. That was also MacArthur's biggest defeat. So he was very heavily emotionally invested in um, the defence and defeat of the Philippines. And he had pledged, you know, I'd come through and I shall return. So he... He made it about himself. Um, the liberation of the Philippines became his personal um, crusade in many ways. And it was also a way, too, to commit the U.S. Army to fight in the Pacific and to balance um, the U.S. Navy because he had Navy, the U.S. Navy under Nimitz. They were fighting the campaign across the Central Pacific, whereas the U.S. Army with MacArthur trying to fight their way through New Guinea across the, the Netherlands, East Indies, and then back up to the Philippines. So um, MacArthur's heavily invested in getting back to the Philippines, and he'd always told and promised the Australians that we would he would take the Australians with us, oh, sorry, with him, back to the Philippines. There's a lot that's going on in 44-45, um, but basically by 1945, that very tight relationship that Blamey, MacArthur, and Curtin had had um, between, say, the Australian diggers and the American GIs in 42. By 45, that relationship is incredibly strained and you have the Australians taking over um, these garrison roles in sort of what is then thought to be sort of secondary um, theatres. Now, it's important to keep in mind, though, that Bougainville was an Australian territory and politically there was a very strong sense from the Australian government and senior military, uh, senior Australian military figures of the need for Australian soldiers to be seen to be actively liberating areas of Australian territory. So we didn't want to have this myth post-war of the Americans coming and saving mainland Australia as well as saving the Australian territory. 
uh, particularly when we had fought and suffered so hard in 42 in Papua and had conducted such successful campaigns in New Guinea in 43. The, the next part of the story was going to be in 45, still thinking and assuming that the war would continue until 1946 or possibly 47. So we can't look, we can't really use too much hindsight when thinking about, well, why did the Australians conduct these offensive campaigns in Bougainville? Um, because they were thinking that they could be stuck as garrisoning these islands for another two or three years rather than thinking, well, let's um, conduct a limited offensive. We won't take too many casualties, but we will clear the island, liberate Australian territory, and then our force, which, as I mentioned, is sizable, that's over 30,000 soldiers, um, can be either freed up to do to have a more meaningful role in the Pacific. So let's fight this campaign. It'll be short, it should be hard, but then we can go on to do something more significant. Well, let's talk about those Australian actions because they are pretty remarkable. I mean, this was, as we said before, it was tough fighting, but Australia is now fighting in a way that they hadn't done in New Guinea, which was almost this hamstrung approach that we don't want too many casualties. We we want to we want to effectively defeat the Japanese on Bougainville, but we don't want we we don't want to lose too many men ourselves doing it. So, tell us about those Australian campaigns. What was the what was the plan, and and then let's dig into what actually happened. Yeah, and this is the part that gets, I think, really <laughs> rather quite exciting. So from Torikino, the Australians then pursued a campaign to now clear the Japanese. Um, and they, the Australians use, they advance in three separate areas. So from Torikino, and that's on the western part of the island of Bougainville, um, one axis of advance was across the mountain range. So from Torikino, they go north. So northeast across the Numa Numa Trail um, to harass and attack the Japanese. And so this is now where they're fighting up in the mountains. So this is territory and, and terrain that looks similar to the Owen Stanleys. Um, so if you can kind of imagine ragged um, high mountains, um, narrow ridgebacks, uh, quite a narrow fighting operational front and where the patrolling and the fighting is really taking place along narrow trails or tracks. <laughs> um, and this area was used by the Australians and Savage wanted to use this as a nursery sector with the idea that with these new Australian units when they're coming in, because for some of the soldiers and some of the units, this is their first time in combat, they'll go through the central sector as a bit of a nursery area where they can patrol, you know, harass the Japanese, fight some limited offensive actions, uh, and then they'll be blooded for want of another term, um, to move into a more active theatre or a more active area of the fighting campaign. So one axis of advance was across the Numa Numa Trail. The other big area was in the north of the island where the Australians followed the coast sort of north-west up towards Booker Island. Um, and the Australians do this by, in part, landing a series of limited offensive um, amphibious operations. So they're not the big sort of battalion size actions. We're talking about small company actions around about 100 to 120 guys um, moving north in leap, kind of leapfrogging, but they're following the coast. Uh, and that works fairly well from late 44 into 1945 until about June of 1945 when the Australians make a landing at a place called Porton Peninsula, um, where they land right in the midst of a very strong Japanese. Um, defensive position. The Australians make a small bridgehead. They're very quickly surrounded. The Japanese are pouring reinforcements and the uh, small force, which is based around a company from 31st, 51st Battalion, um, have to evacuate under fire. But that goes terribly wrong. The landing craft are over... Um, some of them uh, run aground. The soldiers, as they're falling back under fire, um, over make the landing craft on the ground of the reefs, other landing craft is sunk, destroyed, very heavy casualties. Um, there's a couple of landing craft with men just hunkering down for about two or three days before they can be floated off. Um, it just goes horrifically wrong. I read that account in your, uh, in your book about, the, about that, that uh, landing and the evacuation, how badly wrong it went. But imagine what that must have been like for three days to be stuck in a landing craft which is held up on a reef under constant fire from the Japanese. And there was reports of Japanese trying to swim out to the landing craft and machine guns firing from the beach. It must have been horrendous. It was truly her. It would have been her like reading the accounts of survivors. It must have been horrific. There's no food. There's no water. So you're in this closed steel box. It would be incredibly hot. There's this constant pinging against the hull. Um, Cause you know, the Japanese, you can hear the Japanese on the beach taking pot shots at these, um, landing craft that have run aground um every now and again there's a swimmer the japanese swimmer comes out and just 
try to get onto a barge. You've got the blokes inside. They Some of them are wounded. They're counting the rounds. How much ammunition do we have? Because once we've run out of ammunition and that's it, we're potentially we're dead. Um, yes, there's aircraft, Australian and New Zealand aircraft flying overhead, conducting, and they can hear. Um, uh, so uh, what Corsair is flying by the New Zealand Air Force um, strafing runs, you know, brassing up the Japanese on the landing beaches, dropping small bombs, but it's horrific. And, um, yeah, it just goes terribly, terribly wrong. And then following that action, so that's the landing in Porton, the Japanese in the north become resurgent and they start to conduct a very successful insurgency against the Australian lines. Uh, and in many ways, the Australians up north are on the back foot from that latter part of from, well, from June, July, 45 onwards. And Savage, who has had this until now, a good run of successes, becomes very hesitant. Um, he's getting reports that the men up north, that their morale is shaky, so some tanks are being sent up, really just to support the morale of the infantry. Um, but in many ways, the Japanese sort of win that theatre because they had stopped the Australian advance in the northern part of the island. Isn't it interesting, and there's parallels to today as well with the way that we conduct wars, that when you set out to say, well, make sure the casualties are limited, it doesn't take much of a setback to lose your nerve. And I think that was a good instance, that was a good example of it up in the uh, the north of Bougainville, wasn't it? That after after that uh, action at Porton Plantation, the, the Allies really lost their nerve. The Australians lost their nerve in terms of attacking, and it, it went on the back foot a bit and really handed the initiative to the Japanese. It certainly did, um, and the Japanese are infiltrating the Australian lines, they're laying booby traps, so have a, the Japanese have a lot of artillery, they're constantly shelling the guys up north. Um, it, it would have been a very scary time, and now this is the instance when they, their, the rationale for the campaign, an offensive campaign in the north is really questioned. It's like, well, we don't need to clear, as in kill, capture, and destroy the Japanese. We can just leave them there for a little while. They're not going anywhere. They're hemmed in to the very northern part of Bougainville around the Bonus Peninsula. They can't break out, but we've got them contained. Uh, And then because there's a meanwhile, and it's a big meanwhile, um, the main part of the Australian campaign in Bougainville was being fought in the south. So from Torikina, again, on the western side of the island, um, in the middle, the Australians push southwards down towards and push towards Boone. Uh, and here the campaign has been conducted in a much larger area. So in that northern part where you had a brigade was fighting and normally one or two battalions took the lead, in the southern part of the campaign you'd had an entire brigade would push forward with, um, well, this is really where the 3rd Division is engaged um, quite heavily. So more Australian soldiers um, and you were fighting. It's Again, it's a slow plotting campaign but they are really combined arms operations. So the infantry is supported by um, tanks, artillery. As the infantry and the tanks are moving forward behind them, developing roads, developing infrastructure so they can bring the guns forward, um, very close air support working with the Australian, say, Australian Air Force who are flying wirraways, who are spotting, uh, identifying targets for the, the Australian gunners to engage, um, strafing the Japanese, marking targets for New Zealanders who are flying Corsair dive bombers to... Um, to attack and harass. So in the south, you have um, a combined arms operation as they move slowly moving forwards to strangle and destroy the Japanese. That said, the Japanese fought very well, very bravely, and they contest basically every every river crossing, um, every natural ford. Um, the Japanese conduct little raids so they get behind the Australian lines at night. In the main, the Australians moved during the day. The Japanese moved at night. Uh, and they would raid ambush, ambush patrols, uh, attack um, vehicle trains. So you'd have maybe uh, a jeep, and that's taking food and ammunition. The Japanese would attack those jeeps. Um, it's a really gritty, bloody, tough war, and it's slow and it's grinding, and it continues day after day after day after day. From a tactical point of view, Carl, what uh, techniques were the Australians using to keep this line moving forward against the Japanese? So constant patrolling during the day. So sometimes they would patrol to two or three guys who would go out to try to um, build reconnaissance. So into the jungle, off the main tracks, looking, for reporting river crossings, building up that terrain picture. Because the maps that the Australians were using were pretty, uh, very vague, 
largely inaccurate. So you had a lot of small level of trolls going out to build up this intelligence picture. What does the terrain look like? Where are the river crossings? How deep is this river? That type of information. You then had larger patrols going out trying to find and identify where were the Japanese positions. Um, so which tracks were used by the Japanese? Where were the Japanese dug in? What strength? So if you can go out there and figure out where they are, what strength, what's the disposition uh, there are also fighting patrols that were conducted so if you go out and identify a japanese position then they would be able to attack and engage and wear down the japanese defenders and some of these big patrols often operated with um uh, artillery observers so for like artillery parties so if they made a contact they could call in artillery you had the australians with their 25 pounder guns bringing close artillery support um, as they so that type of a patrolling would fan out into the terrain as they're moving south. Uh, behind the individual infantry, once they did make these big push, pushes south, um, the infantry operated with tanks and engineers. So you had guys with metal detectors sweeping the path the road so the main front was along the Boone Road um, so the engineers are going out looking for booby traps looking for mines because the Japanese were very good at laying these improvised what we would now call the improvised explosive devices or booby traps that were based around Japanese artillery shells so the engineers would go out leading the path looking for um, you know mines booby traps and the like behind them you had the Matilda tanks slowly rolling down the road or the path, um, and then to the flanks of the Matilda tanks, you had like infantry fanning out to protect the tanks. So as they move forward, approaching, say, a river crossing, for example, um, you'd often have one or two isolated Japanese positions, usually with artillery, and the Japanese guns would engage the tanks. So then the Australian Matilda tanks are firing back against the entrenched Japanese positions. Meanwhile, the Australian infantrymen would try to outflank these Japanese positions, going further into the bush, operating, and then come around behind the entrenched Japanese positions. Sometimes, if it was a, a big offensive, um, a big Australian offensive, the way forward would have already been attacked and bombed by aircraft. Um, so the Australians and New Zealanders are flying mainly Corsairs, but they're also Wiraways, Boomerangs. Um, that's the type of tactical way it develops. And behind that, you had the, um, the Australians spent a lot of time building up the infrastructure. So the roads were improved constantly. They were being improved. So that meant you had a bulldozer like clearing a path through the jungle. Um, the roads were then corduroyed, so you had logs that were laid across them and they were built up and developed that way, new bridges were being built. So as the infantry and tanks are pushing forward, behind them you had more engineers building the roads, infrastructure, lines of communication, so heavy guns could be brought forward as well, food, supplies. Um, it was very methodical, it was systematic. It was slow, but it worked. Given that description, Carl, which was excellent, thank you for that. It it just sounds like a slow, grueling slog under some absolutely terrible circumstances. How did the men bear the strain of just doing this day in and day out and risking death every day and seeing their mates killed all around them? How did the how did the men in the front line carry on? It was pretty hard um, because it was the, the okay. You got the physicality the being wet because because the rain perspiration river crossings the soldiers themselves were constantly wet um i spoke to guys who would say that their shirts would just rot their boots would fall apart on their feet so this is a pretty tough place to live for weeks and then months on end you have that mental nerve of having to go out into on patrol for a contact during the day um, your day would start if you stood too because that's when the japanese would counterattack. they'd usually attack in the morning or at night so you've got a broken sleep, you wake up early, you're working physically hard all day. So if you're not actually on a patrol, that means, and if you're in a company base or a patrol base, you are digging, you're digging a trench, you're digging your slit trench, you're digging your fences, you're digging mines, you're laying barbed wire. So you're working all of the time, even if you're not actively out sort of fighting. So you're becoming mentally exhausted. Um, food, rations are being brought up. There's, you're not getting a lot of um, variety in your rations not you're still eating it's basically the same type of thing day after day at night you're in the bush you're in the jungle it is pitch black yes you get the only light you see is really from the stars or the moon if you hear like a twig if you hear a noise what is that is that like a native pig is it someone who's broken a stick is it a piece of you know a, uh, a branch falling in the jungle or is it the Japanese soldier? Are they current trying to sneak up in your position? Are they making more noise to make you shoot and to make you fight to give away your position? Um, 
you are constantly living on edge. And there are some really quite clear accounts of soldiers themselves um, breaking, you know, they call it nervousness, just sort of uh, having a bit of a mental, having a mental breakdown, cracking up, cracking up as a term of the day. It wasn't just um, individuals either, was it? Because reading your accounts again, there were quite, you know, reasonably well organised refusals to go on patrol and take part. I, th- I think actions that in the British Army, in particular, would be called a mutiny, or you know, but in uh, in the Australian Army, the, the, I think they consider it just a, a strike or a you know a refusal to work. But um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the most extreme encounter that we know that we know occurred um, happened in the 61st Battalion in about January, February of 1945. So the 61st Battalion, um, they had about two months operating the jungle in the the southern part of um, Bougainville towards Boone. Um, the 61st Battalion had been operating for several weeks. They we know that there are accounts of individual soldiers and then officers, junior officers breaking down, refusing to go on patrol. Um, and it kind of got to the, well, it did get to the point where the battalion commander himself, um, Walter Dexter, Lef- Lieutenant Colonel Walter Dexter, and Dexter had fought throughout the war, um, Middle East. He was an AF volunteer. He was a Middle East, served in the Middle East, commissioned New Guinea, really tough soldier, um, served all of his war in a AOF Battalion then takes over the 61st Battalion. And the 61st Battalion had fought at Milne Bay in 42. So there were some experienced soldiers amongst the 61st Battalion. Um, but, yeah, after these two months or so of just living in this jungle warfare, there were men who broke down and certainly mutinied. Um, officers, re- junior officers got stuck into the battalion command. Well, it's in the 9th Battalion as well. So within the 7th Brigade, there are two battalions, the 61st sort of strikes, or mute, potentially mutinies or jacks up, depending on how you want to phrase it. Um, the 9th Battalion is also has a really tough go of it as well, where soldiers and some junior officers are just questioning why are we doing this, we're exhausted, um, there's no break, there's no relief. Uh, and so it is pretty severe. And there's this one quote from Sergeant John Ewan, um, and he wrote a really detailed personal journal, journal, uh, just about living his experiences being a frontline soldier. And so on the 17th of February, 1945, he wrote in his journal that we were just about had. Living on your nerves in mud, rain, sleeping in holes in the ground, wears a fellow down. I've watched the boys' faces get drawn and haggard and their movements slow and listless. listless. I suppose I must look the same. It's just a harrowing account, isn't it? I mean, was was there any uh, official reprimand of these men, or was it simply did the did the army simply recognise they were at their wits' end and and they just needed a break? It happened so quickly because so Brigadier John Field, so Field's a brigade commander. Um, it happened really quickly from his point of view because he hadn't heard anything, and then within two or three weeks, he has essentially a battalion refusing to go out on patrol. A battalion commander breaks down, and another one of his battalions is incredibly wobbly and so the regimental medical officers all of a sudden start submitting these reports saying um just how bad morale is or combat fatigue is widespread because there's also this concern too that it will become contagious or or notion that it will become contagious and other Australian soldiers and units won't want to won't, won't want to do this so there's a bit of a crisis how that's addressed um the battalion commander at 61st battalion breaks down and so they have to bring in a new battalion commander to relieve um, Dexter. And no, I'll talk about that separately, but Dexter's replaced. Um, some officers are removed. There is a very gentle policy of trying to rest the units and rest battalions. They bring up food, they bring up supplies, they try to develop amenities, they try to um, give soldiers rest, like move them into a rear area so we can have a bit of a rest and a bit of a break. Uh, and there's this really strong emphasis goes back onto from junior officers and your and your leaders so your senior soldiers on man management um bringing up food bring up support like hot food just what that can do to give a soldier a hot meal give them a rest take them into a rear area where they can just have a couple of days break you know, to rest to recharge to refit and then go back out onto the lines uh so it's a really serious case we know it occurred in other units as well, in other parts of the formation of Bougainville. Um, but the 7th Brigade is better documented because you have soldiers such as Ewan, who kept his journal, as well as there's a personal diary from the, some of the battalion commanders as well as the brigade commanders. So it's one of those instances that, as a historian, we can look at this 
um, the jackups or the strike and look at strikes that occurred from different perspectives using different sources. They're hard to find, but they're there. It also means, too, that just because they were well documented in, say, the 61st Battalion or the 9th Battalion, that they didn't occur elsewhere. We know there's a few other, uh, the 8th Battalion, which was fighting up north um, in North Bougainville, they were at one point a little bit wobbly. So that was um, Partridge's Battalion, for example. And there are other instances, too, in some of the other um, battalions of Fort and Bougainville where there's just moments of combat fatigue um, occurs but it's just mainly because the when it happened in the 61st and the 9th battalions within the 7th brigade um, they're just better documented you can read as many histories as you like which talk about tough conditions and the strain on the men of fighting in the jungle but nothing sums it up just the, the nature of the terrible conditions the men were under by the fact that they so many broke down and refused to uh, to participate in those battles. Just absolutely shocking stuff. You mentioned Partridge. Let's talk about the couple of Australian VCs that uh, that were awarded for, for Bougainville. Yeah, yeah, so the two Victoria Crosses are awarded during the campaign. So, well, um, Reg Raddy from the 25th Battalion is awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions on the Boone Road. So this that occurs at the same time that they've got this um, morale issues or these issues of combat fatigue within the 61st Battalion and the 9th Battalion. So um, now I'm just talking about units. So you have the 7th Brigade, the 61st Battalion, the 9th Battalion, and then the 25th Battalion. So while the – and Reg is with the 25th, and they're also fighting in the south, but they have some in really intensive actions. And Reg, um, because of Reg's actions within the 25th Battalion, uh, ordered a Victoria Cross. And this is part of how you raise morale. It's with the, the awarding of – it's recognition, basically. I'm a big fan of the work of Reg Reddy because local boy from West Wylong and uh, he was good friends with my grandfather. So that was that was quite extraordinary, the work that he did. But um, that was at Slater's Knoll, wasn't it, on the in the sort of southeast corner of Bougainville? Yeah, it's just before the big action being fought on Slater's. Um, so Reg is basically moving south. They come under fire um, from the Japanese and it's one of those instances where Reg just kind of snapped ran forward, um, overcame the Japanese and secured the, the Australian advance, the Australian position. Reg was originally recommended for another award, like a, I won't say a less award, but a, another award. It then went up through the chain of command from the battalion to the brigade, went to John uh, Brigadier Field, went all the way to Savage and Savage and Field saw it, went, actually, this is a really impressive action. And they recommended it was Savage went back to Brigadier Field and said, hey, we should make this guy a Victoria Cross. And so it was then resubmitted and he was then elevated to the Victoria Cross. Um, and that's partly because I think there were these sort of strikes and mutinies occurring in the other two battalions within that formation. So the best way to bring up your morale is to say, here's a really brave action and we're going to recognise him. Uh, and they rewrote the citation so that we came at Victoria Cross. It was recommended for a Victoria Cross, which was eventually awarded. So it's one of those instances where you recognise the individual for their brave actions, but also has this knock-on effect of, you know, everyone can take part and have um, and celebrate those achievements. And what about Frank Partridge? Because that was a uh, pretty hard one VC as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's up in the north of Bougainville, a series of Japanese um, fortifications and entrenchments. And again, at one point, um, Frank and Partridge and his uh, units are moving forward. They're pinned down. They're taking – these strains are taking heavy casualties. Uh, and again, Partridge just kind of has that moment where he just goes off alone, um, fights through several Japanese positions. Um, he's using his weapons, a rifle uses up his brain gun, um, eventually kills Japanese with his knife and grenades. Really brutal, very bloody, close quarter fighting. Um, the Japanese are essentially silent, um, as in he's either killed or wounded them all. Partridge is wounded, staggers out, he's covered in blood. Um, his men run forward, his rest of his guys, his mates run forward, secure the area. You know, Partridge kind of collapses from exhaustion, um, but the key moment, in the, the fighting in the, the northern part of Bougainville, up on the Bonas Peninsula. What was the result of all these Australian actions? I mean, there's obviously a lot going on. What was the by the time the war ended? What was the what was the really net result? What had the Australians achieved? It's a curious question because the the most intense fighting takes place in say June, July of 1945. 
the Australians were about to conduct another major push south in in late July of 1945, so the big push towards Boone. But then the rain season comes, uh, the roads, all that infrastructure I mentioned earlier were washed away. So rivers flood, bridges are collapsed. Um, it stops. The rain really stops the Australian push any further south. And then all of a sudden, they get the news. There's a signals being sent saying, hey, um, looks like the Japanese are about to surrender. There's news of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima, the latter in Nagasaki. So almost overnight, the war just suddenly ends. It came as a huge shock to the Australian commanders and the soldiers on Bougainville. So Savage, no one knew about the atomic bombs. Um, They all thought the war was going to continue for many more months to come. And then they just wake up one day and it's like, hey, peace has been declared. The war is over. So this is now really when you get that sense of, well, what was it all for? You know, we fought this eight-month campaign through horrendous conditions from the Australian perspective, over 500 Australians are killed. So it's 516 Australians who were killed or died of their wounds during the campaign. 1,500 Australians uh, are wounded in action. So then you get now these questions about, well, why? What was it worth it? You know, it wasn't a decisive campaign. It wasn't a campaign that was going to end the war in the Pacific or defeat Japan. Yes, we fought quite hard. Um, we liberated large areas of the island of Bougainville and in many ways as the Australians so we were talking sort of tactically as the Australians are fighting and clearing these um, territory as the Australians moved into different areas Bougainville Islanders came out of they came out of the jungle they came out of the bush you know they, they sought the Australians um, the Australians provided medical care medical assistance um, there were doctors who specifically worked for or worked to support the the Bougainvillians. So they're starting to receive medical care, medical attention. So you've got the Australian forces. What did they achieve? They liberated parts of the island. Um, they're quite active in liberating Australian territory. They were fighting to defend um, the Bougainville Islands and the Solomon Islanders. But it wasn't um, one of those battles or campaigns that would end the war. So there is this really weird dichotomy. They did a great job. They probably needed to do it. I think it was justified and legitimate. However, will that, is it worth the cost? Uh, And that's a question that people have asked for the last 70 years. The first people to criticise the need for an offensive campaign on Bougainville, many of them were veterans and, well, soldiers themselves writing at the time. You know, why am I here? Why am I in Torikina? Why am I pushing south on the Boone Road? Why can't we be in the Philippines, you know? We're not defending Australia anymore. We're on the offensive. The Japanese aren't going anywhere. Um, It's never, I mean, there will never be a definitive answer. It all comes down to perspectives. Was there uh, much um, criticism from the families of the men who'd been killed that you came across in your research? It depends. Not so much at the time. And the, the tempo, the Australian tempo of the campaign increases over time. So in at the end of 44, so we arrive in October 44. The handover takes place in November. The first campaign, the first movements are kind of slow. But during the course of 1945, as more and more units are moved into to Bougainville and we get the Australian forces become stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, some units, so the 15th Brigade, for example, under Brigadier Tack Hammer, the 15th Brigade was the last to arrive. They didn't get to Bougainville Island until mid-1945. They then fight really well and quite hard actions in um, the South. But because they get there a little bit later, all these other events elsewhere in the world are taking place. And so there's more criticisms of the necessity of the campaign from people such as the brigade commander. So Tack Hammer himself thinks, well, why, you know, we're not going to end the war here, but we have a job to do and we're going to do it. So in many ways, it is that professionalism of the soldiers the season through and individually many men were quite happy to you know they've trained for years and this is a it'd be like if you're playing football and you're constantly in a reserve reserve bench and then finally you get a chance to play for australia you want that big game you want to get out there and do it the doubt and the, the criticism comes often sort of later now certainly if you lost your son or a brother killed in in one of these actions. And again, 516, that's almost the same number of Australians who died in the Vietnam War. It's a substantial figure. Nothing of what I've ever said will bring back that loved one. So it may be one thing for the Australian government 
and say, yep, we needed to have Australian soldiers fight to liberate Australian territory, or yes, we needed to fight. We fought a campaign very successfully. We had very few casualties compared to, say, the Japanese. Um, that's not going to bring back your father. That won't bring back your brother. Was it worth it? Always be contested. Well, mate, I think that's a great note to end it on. I, I think I think it's important we ask these questions after all this time, and and, and we look back um, because we can learn lessons from it. If if the if our reasoning was was in some way flawed to decide to go to certain to participate in certain battles or indeed certain wars, it's important we learn those lessons. But I think you've summed that up very very well, and I don't think the question will ever ever be definitively answered: Was the Bogan camp Boganville campaign worth it? But you've certainly painted a, an absolutely wonderful picture of um, of what was going on there. So, Carl, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me again, Matt.